Welcome back, everyone, to to the. Welcome back, everyone. To, why is it so loud? Welcome back, everyone, to the the Lobster Roll series, week three, and the losers quarterfinals. We have Steel Blue versus Bloa, and we're going to be playing on Cobalt Dream again. I hope y'all like this map, because it's getting played a lot. Clearly the players do. So I hope you, the audience, likes it, because that's what we're seeing. Although, in a change of pace, Steel Blue is going for rovers! Hey, It's not tanks. Rovers. They're not tanks. Alright. Blue, on the other hand, I'm not sure if they've picked anything yet. I think they are... Maybe still working on connecting? I'm really not sure what they'll go for, but probably it'll be tanks. Yep, it'll be tanks. So we have tanks versus not tanks. Steel Blue, definitely the favorite to win this. They have, I mean, they got a lot more experience, and I think they're also higher rated as well. Though, I gotta say, Bloa is a contender. They have been making strong showings. It's more a question of how quickly they're going to be able to get their economy up, how quickly they're going to get their army up. We're seeing Steel Blue immediately going out with the dart. Just for a bit of scouting. Not really going to get any major kills in. But it will at least get them an idea of where Bloa's base is, or how Bloa's base is arranged, and maybe get a few hits in. It's... It would actually be useful against the Kodachis now that I think about it. And I really am curious to see what happens. Proper Rover versus Tank. Because I think Dart Scorcher versus Kodachi with the Dart Slow is actually not... I don't know if it's that in favor of Kodachi. Part of me feels like it would be just because Kodachis are definitely strong. I mean, you want to make sure that you're dealing with the fact that they're constantly shooting fire at you. But at the same time, you slow them down that... Kind of ruins a big advantage they have with a fire rate. Anyway. Steel Blue coming in, slowing down a Metal Extractor, which does indeed, very apparent, very clearly, it does slow down the Metal Gather rate, which is a neat little trick. Has slight bit of harassment, nothing major, but it's a fun little thing you can do. It's a party trick. Show your friends. At any rate, Scorchers are in here, so the Kodachi is going to have a rather tricky time actually getting any raiding done. The drone doesn't help either. Right now, Bloa is actually struggling quite heavily to get in and do any real damage. Although I noticed Bloa is going for the same kind of wind generator placement we saw with Golda and Randy earlier. I guess that's just going to be the meta wind placement. Although it's less tightly packed than the way that Randy and Golda were doing it. On the other hand, Steel Blue going much more for a very defensive curl around with the with all of these power plants, making sure that nothing can really go behind and raid out. Which is something you do see on flat maps sometimes, but I find it's something you see from you don't see a lot from the highest level players. And I don't I don't really know I think a lot of you just see because of the fact that higher level players have more confidence in their ability to manage radar, and lower level players don't necessarily know to care. But it's like mid, mid high level players that will build this out because it's just, it keeps them safe. You have to build power anyway, and it doesn't require as much constant attention to radar. Because if something does sneak in, it can't hit the factory from behind. At any rate, though, Steel Blue is definitely putting themselves in a very strong position. They've defended beautifully. They're... I don't know if they're looking to attack. They do have a small group of raiders coming in here, but for fighting tanks as rovers, the one complication is that welders do shoot, and they deal 45 damage a second, which isn't nothing. Especially when your main raider has 480 health. It's like 11 seconds, and they're dead. Alright, well, at any rate... 
There it comes. There's the dart with the Kodachi, and it actually is allowing a Kodachi kill, although it's at the cost of a dart and a Scorcher, but hey. Free Metal Extractor. Another free Metal Extractor, maybe? Uh, it's not free. Nope. But Metal Extractor is gone anyway. Oh, it was free! The Scorcher got away! How about that? And a leveler at the front, or the Ripper, rather, on the front side, too. Getting rid of another couple of Metal Extractors. Really damaging blows economy. Reclaim is still there, but... It's not going to be enough, especially as we have more darts coming along the side. Not sure what they're going to do besides cheekily slow down Metal Extractors to reduce their production, but... Hey, 10 metal per second was just removed from Blow's economy. Steel Blue is looking strong. At any rate, it's... Actually, okay, how many, for people talking about the map, map in chat, and how many is pointing out that it'd be nice if wind had a greater difference. I mean, the thing is, the difference between 0.7 and 0.3, which is the amount on the ground, is... Oops. Like, it's 0.3 on the ground, it's 0.4 up here, it's 0.7 over here. 0.7 is generally considered the threshold between wind generator being the way to go and solar being the way to go. 0.3 is well below that. So actually, the fact that on the hill it's 0.7 is a significant difference. It's kind of weird. It's, it's really obtuse element of the way that the averages and the numbers work for cost. But yeah, 0.7 wind is the point where you'd build it over solar. And that's what you get in the high ground. So there is a positioning difference. It's just weirdly obtuse. At any rate, position difference or no, Blow has actually managed to recover reasonably well. Getting, getting blitzes up on Kodachi. The Rippers are having a hard time actually maintaining a position. I do like that Steel Blue is, switch, is getting up the Caretakers to do this. And it looks like they're, on top of that and the power economy, they are clearly looking to get some reclaim going. I will, of course, point out that there isn't a whole lot of reclaim on the field. It's... Pretty limited so far, a bunch of, uh, eh, maybe 500 or so, most of it's inside of Blow's territory. So, at the moment, not really the most useful. But, it could eventually become a thing. Also, Steel Blue, penning in Blow up. I'm not sure, they've got to be aware of Blow now. Their commander's right there. Yeah, the radar's totally there. They know. They, they know. But, it was a good try. Blow are looking to try to defend that, break through the line of metal extractors. No real defense is in the way, so it's not a problem. Trying to hold on to make sure this proxy cloaky factory comes up. And nothing is actually really significantly stopping it. I think that factory's going to come up anyway. I mean, a lot of these forces coming in from Blow are going to be killed inside of a steel loose territory, which means, of course, you know, a few hundred metal reclaim. Stable's commander also coming in here, and it's not going to be here in time. The factory is done. Not sure if it's going to build anything. It almost might as well. I mean, he went all, through all the trouble of making it, but no, Bloa is not there, and that is... That is huge. Oh, they've lost this. I think this is it. That was that was a weird... almost. That was a cheese play, kind of. And now it's just metal donation. They're going for Glaives, and that would have been actually not a bad idea overall if they hadn't been spotted. But it got spotted. Because the commanders have radar. They can easily see what's going on around there. So with that, now Steel Blue with 700 metal worth of reclaim and Bloa having wasted two minutes of production. Yeah, Bloa is... They're far behind. They're super far behind. I don't... I... I mean, I can see maybe one good battle. Though, Rippers against Blitzes has so far worked out in favor of Rippers. I don't expect that to change anytime soon. The properties of the units haven't changed any. And with Dart support... Oh, and Domi support... Oh my goodness, Dominatrix coming in as well. Yeah, that's going to be... We're going to be seeing some Metal Extractor caps, I think. <laughs> that's when it gets real cheeky, is when you start capturing Metal Extractors. I mean... The most fun is when you capture your opponent's commander or factory. That's that's when it's absolutely totally off the wall. Like that that is just That's when you know you've absolutely won. And now we're seeing how the rippers they're taking over. 
taking out the blitzes and oh metal charge is being taken over I mean blow up gonna blow it up but it's it's been taken it's done and another one comes down there let's just take care of the solar collector as well why not Blow at the same time does still have a reasonable economy at least. They can still build up units, ogres and minotaurs to try to come back from this. Though it's looking tough. And the ogre gets taken out by the Dami, of course. Dominatrix is definitely the late game key for the rover army against tanks. And there it goes. <laughs> it's like you either play tanks or you play your opponent's tanks. That's kind of how it works for the rover tank matchup. Blow's commander, however, is... They're done. They are done. Blow's commander's out. And another cloak factory? And I agree with the people putting down these signs here. What is with the cloak factories? Atomic Fred. Like, what is with the cloak factories? Especially where they are. I, I mean, okay, I can kind of see... Maybe cloak and tank, because you get different levels of... Chunkiness. But for Reavers, I mean, Reavers are not bad against this. Like, I would, if you're going to go for Cloak Bots, get Imps. Like, seriously, get Imps, place them around the map so that the units coming from the vehicle factory get taken out by them, and then your forces can wipe them out with absolutely no resistance. That's the only reason I could see to drop into Cloak when you have Tank. Or mass Glaives to overwhelm the Dummies. But... Just to get some Reavers? I don't see it. Anyway, blow up throws in the towel. That is going to be it. That is Steel Blue taking the match and moving on to the loser semifinals. Well, blow up on the other hand. They did go 3-2. That's respectable. But I still don't understand what their motivation was with the Cloakbot Factory. Like I said... For what they're doing, what they're facing, I could see using it for imps. I could see maybe using it for... I could actually see using it for the Spectre, or the Phantom. Because the Phantom would be able to take out the Dominatrix without issue. Like, it was just one-shot Dommies. So that's totally understandable. So overall, though, yeah, it comes about the same. Steel Blue's army massively... Well, Steel Blue's army got bigger because of largely attrition. Metal use was basically even. <clears throat> so yeah, that is going to be... The losers' quarterfinals. So we'll have the losers' semifinals in just a moment. Maybe I'll just do the entire losers' bracket as one video. I'm just debating what to do because I'm feeling like I'm going to have so many videos on YouTube that I. Let me think. I had round one, quarter, semi, final, four, quarter. I think I'll do losers' semis and losers' finals as one, one video. Oh no, wait. No, I'll keep going with this one. We won't take a break right now. We'll just keep going and... I guess wait for the next match. Yeah, I suppose that'll work. Alright. I think I'm giving you two guys too many peeks behind the curtain. So far, though, we are waiting now on Steel Bloom Blow to get their... Smash your G stuff sorted out. Once that's done, we can move on to the loser semis. Well, I believe that's going to start pretty well right away. Oh no, we're already into setting up the next match. So yeah, it looks like we're going to be getting Stuart and Steel Blue. We have... Okay, well this hasn't been sorted out yet. It will be soon enough, I imagine. But yeah, Stuart and Steel Blue, they are the... They are the loser semifinals. Might as well throw that in. It is now loser semifinals. So yeah, I'll just keep going until the end of the Losers Finals, and then take a small break, and then come back to the Grand Final, which is going to be BO3.
All right, we're good. Everything has been sorted. We can move on. Steel Blue and Stewart will be able to get their whole thing started. And I think they've already gotten all the bands and everything sorted out. Well, the map bands, I should say. All that sorted out. Because, yeah, for those of you not familiar, I mentioned earlier, the way this works is that each... The, the bottom-seated player gets to ban four maps out of a pool of ten. And then... And unfortunately, I don't have the stuff set up to actually show it easily. But they ban four maps out of a pool of ten. And then from there, the remaining six maps, the other player gets to choose. So from here, we will have... Okay, we're just waiting on who's going to ban what. Ah, come on. So anyway, we're just waiting. On, sorry about this delay. We are just waiting on the players to sort out map stuff. So yeah, they pick that person who is higher seed picks, and then we play the game. Just the players trying to sort out who is in fact seeded higher. My standings might be a little bit out of date. They're based on what was last updated to the page that's actually handling the ranking stuff, but I don't. I don't think it's entirely up to date because the this tournament has been added in, and I think there was some other stuff going on. So at this point, Stuart is in fact the third seed and Steel Blue is the fourth seed, so Steel Blue is the one who gets to handle the banning. So it wasn't quite done yet. I thought it was because Stuart thought they were the lower seed. Just gonna wait a bit. I mean, it's, this is kind of a soft break. I just don't want to split the video. That's all. And if you take a proper break, I'm going to have to split the video. Yeah, the winner of this, of course, you can see fight Gold fights Golda and... Oh, that's not right. There we go. The winner of this fights Golda. The winner of that fights Randy. So, we are back to Cobalt Dream, of course. Okay, I hope Cobalt Dream and Red Comet aren't in the next pool. There's big surf some variety. It's like, sheesh, how many times? I don't know. I find it just weird, like, how often we have the top players always going for the flat maps. Like, I don't know. It feels like an issue on the map pool side. Like, I'm not blaming the top players for doing that. Like, again, if you're a strong player, then the macro game is easier, and you might as well prioritize that. It's just that if the map pool isn't built in a way that makes that not always an option, then it's the thing. I honestly kind of think... I like the way Acronym had their map pool set up. That did a pretty good job of making sure that no one was just going on to one map all the time. And I realize it's a little bit harder to sort out in terms of, like, what maps are valid to what pool. And we tried the first week, and that seemed to be confusing. But at the same time, like, it's just been Cobalt Dream after Cobalt Dream after Cobalt Dream. Or with the occasional Red Comet. That, that came up once. Stupid. Ah. All right. I really ought to just put the Ami Declusion in a widget. Anyhow. The... Yeah, so Stuart. Go for tanks. Everyone go for tanks. It's always tanks. Tank be tank. We don't get to see a nice tank versus rover mirror like we saw last time. It is... Or not mirror. Tank versus rover match. It is a tank mirror on Cobalt Dream. Welcome to the Lobster Row Weeklies. Hopefully this is something that the map pool is adjusted for next week. It's like, yes, I am sorry. I'm a little unhyped for this, being that this is the 12th match on Cobalt Dream that I have seen today. 
give or take. And I think the 10th tank mirror that I've seen on this map. In the last three hours. I am a little bit tired of Cobalt Dream. I don't think an additional ban would do the trick. I mean, how are we pointing on the chat that the next tournament is going to get Comet patched out and the ban will be added? It's like, okay, that's great, but I think it's more that there might have to be, like, a couple of pools. Maybe not, like, one pool per round, like with the Swiss tournaments, but maybe, like, a pool for not semis and finals, a pool for, like, winners before semifinals and finals, losers and winners semifinals and finals. Like, semifinals, finals, grand finals. Something like that. Although I think, again, part of it is that there's... Maybe it is the number of bands, because, again, there are three C-maps and four bands. It's like... I'll also just point out, Steel Blue is absolutely wrecking Stuart 98's base. Like, Stuart 98 has not been able to do anything against this. The Kodachis have been completely destroying everything with no losses whatsoever... Revenge shot coming in here from Stuart 98, but it's not able to accomplish much beyond killing a single metal extractor. So it looks like Stuart 98 is going to be in a very tight spot going forward. But yeah, I don't know. I think maybe if there weren't three C maps, or maybe just if there were fewer maps in general, like six maps instead of ten, and you only had one C map, I would suggest... I think it's Iski Channel is the newer one. That's pretty cool. No, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's your channel. Maybe keep it that one. So yeah, Steel Blue at this point, though. They are... Actually, they're kind of falling behind a bit. They have they did some good rating damage, but they're falling behind in economy, and they're managing to do a little more damage here. But now it's just Stuart trying to defend, but again, they have a stronger economy so far. Steel Blue is definitely building and rebuilding and will have a stronger economy soon enough. So yeah, ignore what I just said. There's Stuart 98. It's just falling away behind. Steel Blue continuing to contain them, and that's basically what it comes down to. Steel Blue gonna try to do anything with that? No, that radar tower's not getting anything done for it. So as it stands, Steel Blue is just, they are just keeping Stuart 98 in check. They're just not letting anything happen that they don't have control over. And although they're not expanding as quickly as I expect them to, they are still expanding. Yeah, Commander going down the side. That Kodachi has no shot of living whatsoever. Stuart 98, on the other hand, their commander... Okay, what has it got? It has a lightning rifle! It's actually in a good position to deal with the Kodachis. So that is how that is going to turn out. But anyway, with this... We are going to see a... Very likely 10 minute or less game. I'm, I'm just... I mean, we're seeing the blitzes come in. They're doing some damage. They're getting rid of some of the Kodachis. That's good to see. Stewart is managing to get a little bit of their economy going. But it's... It is kind of tricky. But yeah, I mean, the thing is, we're on Flatmas. There's some discussion going on about why water is hated. Like, the thing is, what's hard to understand, what it's hard to realize at first is that 0k is three different games. There's 0k on flat maps, which we're seeing right now. There's 0k on hilly maps, which you saw a bit on Bandit Plains. And there's 0k on sea maps, which we did see once on Shimmer Shore. And the thing is, those are three very different games. The factories used do not overlap. There's occasional overlap between hilly and flat, but by and large, what works doesn't overlap. The factories are different, so it ends up being different games. 
And the flat map game is probably the easiest one to learn. You don't have the variable of terrain height and cliffs to worry about. You just have to worry about getting a lot of metal, building a lot of units, and positioning your units reasonably okay. Hill game is a little bit harder to learn because there's, like I said, height differences. And you also start pulling in ma factories like spiders and jumpbots alongside Cloaky, which have a lot of tricks going on that can be difficult to deal with and require a lot more lateral thinking. And then sea maps are, again, mutually exclusive factories, but also you have to deal with the whole underwater on like underwater and surface dynamics and how to sort that out. Granted, the currency is a bit easier to learn, but still, it's a different game. So that's kind of why it's hard to have all of these different maps going on, because essentially you're trying to, you're asking the players to choose which version of Zero K they want to play. Just because of how different the dynamics are in different maps. So a lot of players are ban banned C because it's a different game, and so against stronger players in an environment where you just don't want to lose, why would you take the risky choice unless you've been practicing C specifically? And hilly maps some players want to go for because oftentimes like for newer players often they go for it because Cloaky is more often considered the newbie factory where it's pitched as a newbie factory, especially with the way the campaign is set up. And those work better on hilly maps. But for stronger players with really good macro skills, flat maps are the easiest one because they don't have to worry about hill micro or like don't have to worry about high ground micro. They don't have to, they don't have to worry about all the different tricks that hilly factories tend to have up their sleeve it's just straightforward get metal build units push in and fight no tricks no traps and that's something which is very straightforward and kind of easy and again in a tournament environment where the key thing is to not lose and try to find the easiest way to victory for players who consider themselves stronger than their opponents macro wise and there's a pretty big skill gap when it comes to macro management skill it's just easier to pick the map that rewards that most straightforwardly <laughs> i heard to be pretty pointing out in the chat we saw go to build urchins but it's like yeah no that's that's a misclick i knew that was a misclick go to saying it was a misclick that was absolutely a mistake i don't even i don't know if this map even has i don't think this map has water under it i haven't tried digging but i don't think this map is lying on top of water. I think you just keep digging. So you wouldn't even be able to make urchins useful in any capacity. But yeah, that's basically what it comes down to, is that the... It's like, you pick the safe choice, and that's why you get tank mirrors. That's why you get flat maps. It's just... There's a lot of options, but the safe choice is just it's not something that it's safe. It's not being punished in any way. And the risky choice just isn't worth enough, especially in the meta sense of picking what map to play. But I mean, even in the factory sense, I mean, tanks, they do scale into the late game well, so on macro maps, they work really well. Whereas rovers can do some cool plays and do have options into the late game with larger numbers of units and dominatrix. But that's trickier to pull off. It's less risky just to have big, meaty units push in and deal damage. Right, that's always the thing to bear in mind. It's not a matter of how... It, not, players aren't trying to win in the flashiest way possible. They're trying to avoid losing. As a general rule. So yeah, that's the one thing about Cobalt Dream is that it's not really... It is a map that encourages tank play. Just because, again, it's flat. There's no real tricks to it. There's not much reason to go for rovers, honestly. Because it's such a metal-heavy map, you're not... Like, tanks are going to be able to get their 30 plus, 40 plus metal per second that they need to actually have a reasonable amount of units on the field. So it really doesn't make a difference. You might as well just go for the tank factory because you have the metal to make it work. Especially when you have two Cyclopses coming in here from Steel Blue. Ready to completely demolish everything Steward 98 has built up. I mean, why not just take it out? 
Big ol' Cyclops coming in. Another Cyclops in behind. Ready to take out the army that's built up in the meantime. And there goes the Blitz. That means the Kodachis actually have a lot of room to maneuver. I mean, they're still the Ogre, sure, but the Kodachis are worried a bit more about the Blitz, because they can retreat against the Ogre. They can't really retreat against the Blitzes as easily. I mean, they can, it's just... Yeah, the Blitzes have more mobility. And also the push with the welders, because why not? Welder push, get rid of the metal extractors, build their own metal extractors. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, Steel Blue is... It's actually kind of funny, they're not that far ahead. Attrition-wise, okay, they are now, yes. And economy-wise, they're a little bit. But it was only like 10 metal per second. It was only like a 16% lead. Although, to be fair, one of those Cyclopses is about to go down. The other Cyclops not moving into support. First Cyclops is just going to die. Though a Stinger is up, which is nice. Helpful to the welders that are up at the top. But now Stuart 98 has lost a ton of their economy. They lost a ton of their position. It's just going to be a matter of building up more metal extractors and Steel Blue's going to turn this game into a complete blowout. I mean, Stuart 98, I think, still does have a, bit, have a bit of a chance. If they can kill all the Cyclopses and reclaim the corpses, although reclaiming the corpses is a very tall order with this Stinger right there. But if they can do that, then there is a shot. It is a long shot, as they are losing units, losing expensive units very rapidly, and the Cyclops is also being repaired. So it is a tough, it's a very tough thing to do. And I don't see, no, it's not, no. Steel Blue is playing this really well. They're making sure to avoid losing the Cyclops. They might lose, they'll lose a welder or two, but they're absolutely stringing Stewart along as far as attrition goes, and more Cyclopses are on the way. Steel Blue does have now a 30 metal per second advantage, even though they're not spending all of it. They do have the metal to spend. Unless like they're going to get some caretakers up in order to do so. So with that, like, they can at least put Steel Blue or Stuart in a position where they're just feeding metal. And that's what we're seeing. Just a bunch of metal feeding. Like, this is... Actually, not so bad. Only one Minotaur died in the territory, but... Still doesn't amount to about 2,000 metal worth of reclaim. Which, to their credit, Stuart 98 is taking as much as they can of. And that's absolutely the right move. I mean, they lost their worker, but they did take a lot. They did take some metal in the process. Not quite enough to pay for the welder, but still, it was a good move. I, I don't disagree with it, even though it was, it was countered, but it was the right call. However, at this point, it's actually Stuart 98's reclaim field. Stuart 98 has gotten this all to themselves. This is their chance. If they have any chance in this game to come back, it is right now sending three or four welders over to this reclaim field and grabbing all of it. Using that to even out the economy differences between the two players, and then turning that into a massive lead. Because the one thing that's different between the two players is that we see Stuart 98 has the plate as well as the main factory. While Steel Blue is entirely focused on building up Cyclopses. And welders, but mostly Cyclopses. And Cyclopses are great against really heavy units, but they aren't really meant... They, they could fall apart to attrition. I mean, it's going to be tough because, of course, they are very beefy. But again, they're not that super awesome against large numbers of units. So this might not be the best overall strategy for Steel Blue compared to the way Stewart's got this played out as far as defense goes. But again, Stewart needs to have like three or four welders over here and already Steel Blue's way ahead of them on that front. Stewart kind of lost their timing chance here and that might be it. Stewart having lost the ability to reclaim this area effectively. It strikes me as a major blow to their ability to actually get any real economic parity with Steel Blue and potentially get back in the game. Yeah, that welder not even being paid attention to. It's just going to go down completely unremembered. Stuart forgot about it. It's totally, it's unremembered. I say what I say for a reason. Well, 
Well, that is... That looks to be it, then. Sterling United does have a Cyclops of their own, at least. That's something. But Steel Blue... They're ahead of nutrition. They're ahead of economy. They're just... Pushing... Everything. And they're reclaiming a ton as well. Although a lot of it is being... Lost to excess. Actually, I'm kind of surprised they haven't set up an air factory or something. What are they setting up here? What is Steel Blue doing? Steel 98 is actually coming in for a raid. A pretty notable one, too. Okay, Desolator being built up. Is that... I have the attack range? No, it's not got a huge attack range. What in the world is Steel Blue doing? I, you know, seriously, what in the world are they doing? I have no idea what they're up to. This is bizarre. Like, I, I am genuinely confused as to what exactly Steel Blue is up to right now, because Steel Blue, they got this Desolator, and they've got the other stuff kind of going for them, but I don't know. This doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe they're just playing to not lose again. Get rid of the army as it comes in. Eat it up with reclaim. Maybe? Oh, but it's not going to work, though. Steward 98 wiping out all the fusion plants. Wiping out the factory. This is actually pretty meaningful. Same time a counterattack is coming in here. A bit of a base trade setup. But, yeah, this actually isn't working. The Desolator lost its power grid immediately. Steel Blue does have enough forces to easily rebuild their factory and start start from scratch over somewhere else, but that was devastating. That was surprisingly devastating. Steward 98, I don't think they brought themselves back into the game, because these these Cyclopses are going to end it. But that was still a that was still a valiant counterattack. If nothing else. This is it's still cool. I mean I gotta say that was absolutely a neat play. But Steward 98 had nothing to back it up, and that is that. Factory down, plate down. Ha! <laughs> and why not have a proxy cloaky factory? Or not proxy, actually. Off to the side cloaky factory. It's the opposite of proxy. A distant cloaky factory. I... I have no idea what the players are even doing anymore. I think they're just tired. At any rate, Steel Blue still has this game in the bag. They don't even have any production structures right now that have this game in the bag. I mean, neither does their opponent. The Cloaky Factory isn't even up yet. And how many Cyclopses are there? There are one. There's one Cyclops belonging to Stewart and seven belonging to Steel Blue. That. That I think is that. There's, yeah, like Steel Blue is taking over Stewart's base. Stewart has nothing except the one cloak factory in the corner. Well, there's a cloak factory. There's some glaives coming up in 16 metal per second. Oh, but a proxy cloak factory from Steel Blue because why not? I guess. We're just doing cloaky now. Still not even paying attention to the northeast. Doesn't even care. Too rich to care. Cyclops cost 2200, Randy. So, yeah, between all the Cyclopses, the army value for Steel Blue on Cyclopses alone is like 19,000. Actually, I could double check that, because that Cyclops there is going to die. Oh, sorry, we lost two. It's only six now. Still quite a lot. But it's, it's, yeah, at this point it'd be about 1,100. Or... Yeah, that's right. Or 11,000, my bad, 11,000. Anyway, Stuart throws in the towel. Steel Blue moving on to the Losers Finals against Golda. We'll see what they do with their maps, because they are the low seed. They get to choose which maps can be played. Yeah, Steel Blue. Massive income advantage from the beginning, basically. 
Army value was on par, though. Like, for a long time, it was actually surprisingly close. Stewart looked like they were building defenses more than anything. Defenses and economy. Army value was neck and neck, and Stewart did have a bit of a chance as a result, but... Yeah, it was still... Not, not even. No, there was, a, there was an opening, kind of. I think maybe in the middle, but Stewart... I don't know, they couldn't, they didn't really have enough units to take advantage of any openings. Not relative to Steel Blue. So that is going to be that. We're moving on to Losers Finals. It's not updated yet, but it will be. Losers Finals are going to be Gorda and Steel Blue. Not sure we're... So yeah, we're up, up at the end, so congratulations to Stuart getting fourth place. Steel Blue now fighting for potentially most. I just realized Gota isn't in the standings. Huh. I guess they weren't playing the last couple weeks. Oh, Stuart pointing on the chat that Steel had the attrition advantage. I missed that. That's that's fair. They did. They absolutely did. Yeah, just from the early Kodachis onward. So it was absolutely the case that, yeah, Steel Blue built up that way, and that's for sure. While building everything into defenses. Alright, Steel Blue with their bans, and it looks like we're probably going to have Cobalt or Red Common again. Banning Mech, Sparkles, Frosty Cove, and Bandit Plains. Oh, Sparkles Reef! That was the one that I liked, not... Not Iski Channel. Sparkles Reef, that's what I meant before. That's the cool new one. Mm. Anyway. Google Frog's not here. Anyway. We have... So, yeah, we're on to the second to last match. Gota is... Is it BO1? It's BO1. So, looks like we have possibly Cobalt Dream coming up. Well, anyway, go to gets the choice, and Cobalt Dream is definitely on that. Oh, go is going in Red Comet. Oh, giving me a bit of a break from Flat Map Land to go to Flat Map Land. But it's horizontal Flat Map Land instead of vertical Flat Map Land, which... To be perfectly honest, I actually prefer. Not gonna lie, Red Comet's actually more more interesting map, partly because of the fact that it is wider than it is tall, so it's easier to ca get in the whole camera. And partly just because, again, it's got a lot more terrain variation going on.
Okay. So we're on to Red Comet. And... We are... At least going to see something a bit different. A tank mirror on Red Comet, not a tank mirror on Cobalt Dream. <sighs> okay, so waiting on this, we have... Steel Blue, who's been playing quite well. Very defensively, though. Golda, who's been playing, a, like, at least in Cobalt Dream, a cut-through-the-center strategy. And I expect Red Comet we won't see much different. But then again, Red Comet tends to get that line going. I think Golda's going to be just expanding along the bottom of the map rather than along the middle. But we are ready. Okay, there we go. You can see the thing is gone. We have the thing going. We're just waiting for all the formalities to be done. Ah, uh, forget. I'll just deal with this stuff. Never mind, they got it sorted. My apologies, Season Smash GG is a bit, a bit convoluted. I think there already are ways of communicating this stuff. I don't know. This is clearly. Oh, I think next week we'll be using Challenge back to that because it's just more straightforward. But we'll see. I don't know. I mean, Smash GG gives a lot of options for how reporting can work. I think in this case, just we're getting a lot of l growing pains or learning pains or whatever. Trying to get used to it. Alright, let's... Uh, back to this. We have... No idea. Looks like everyone's just trying to decide, figuring out what's going on. Gorda going from bottom left, going defensive. Steel Blue going middle and going hovers. Hey, not a tank mirror. We got hovers. We got a hover mirror. Wow, that that is genuinely surprising. I totally expected a tank mirror, but no, we are getting a hover mirror today. Gorda going a little more economical, at least starting out with a quill. Steel Blue, on the other hand, just going full-on dagger. Both players clearly sick of tanks. They want to play something, anything else. I'm not really sure who's got this. Gorda has been a absolute legend with hovers in the past, but I haven't really seen a lot of their hover play recently, so honestly, I have no idea. This is going to be neat. This is going to be fun to watch, and I don't know where this is going to go. And uh, it looks like so far it's going to be possible mutual suicide. That's not ideal, but Steel Blue's got the slight advantage when it comes to attacking. I mean, they have more daggers coming in. They have no quills, though. They're just building non-stop daggers. But, I mean, their commander can do their job, so that works. It looks like Steel Blue has... Yeah, they got the radar coverage on that dagger. They're gonna intercept it. Golda is not gonna be able to keep the dagger alive. There it is. That's gone, and Gorda has no way of scouting or getting in, and Steel Blue has four daggers. Three daggers. Three daggers. And should be able to defend no problem. Also heal... Oh, that, that is clever. Just healing them enough so that they don't get one... They don't get two shot. They get three shot. Steel Blue knows what they're doing. Like, Steel Blue's got that... I Got the right idea. They know... 
what they can work with here. Oh, no, sorry. It's crazy in chat. It's Smash GG. I, I use it for... I've used it when I've been playing in various fighting game tournaments. I It's... It's really good for big tournaments where you have a bunch of different brackets or a bunch of different events in the same in the same tournament. For what the lobster roll stuff is doing, it's overkill. And it's honestly been kind of confusing to people who are coming in to play it. Anyhow, back to the game. Steel Blue continuing to defend themselves quite nicely, though Gorda, they're using that as a distraction. They're building in the process. They don't really care. Steel Blue, on the other hand, has to deal with the fact that they haven't defended stuff well, whereas Gota, they have some lotuses around, along with some power plants to kind of get in the way. Like, it's not... Steel Blue, on the other hand, they're being very naked in their expansion. On the other hand, they do have the daggers to make it potentially a good punish play to come in here. It's going to be tricky, though, because there are still, of course, all of these... All these lotuses. And the lotuses are not easy kills. Man, I mean, there's so many metal -like strategies here that haven't been taken. The quill looks like it might be going for them eventually. As a Steel Blue's commander, although I don't understand quite why they have the lotuses here and don't have the second lotus over here. So I feel like if the second lotus was over here, then they'd be able to defend against where the units would be more likely coming from. Or maybe where this one is, and then this one would be over here. So it would cover all their bases. But the way I have it set up now, it just... I don't know, that's a really tiny nitpick. But, yeah, that's... I don't know, defense... Defense placement is weirdly important, because you generally don't build very many of them. On the other hand, bolas are basically moving defenses, so why not? Still, though, you don't see Steel Blue actually doing a lot to punish Gorda being as aggressive as they have been. Go to triple plate as well. They are going mass daggers. I mean, that's how Golda plays hover, but like, they're absolutely going for that. That's that's just what they're doing. Mass daggers all day. And now we're finally seeing an attempt to punish, but by now, Golda has already built up an army. Steel Blue actually falling quite a bit behind in terms of economy. Losing a quill, too, for basically free, as well as several metal extractors. This is a massive blow Steel Blue definitely going to try, but already on the first Alpha Strike, losing basically all of their daggers. The Bolas is still able to come in here, but the daggers are all dead. The last remaining dagger goes down. The Bolas is now stuck, staring down death. Taking out what they can in the process, but that was a suicide mission. And that was also the last gasp that Steel Blue had of actually getting any real punish on Gota for Gota being as aggressively economical as they have been. Gota, it's totally paid off. Like, Steel really needed to have attacked a couple minutes earlier. But now that they haven't, go to... They've got a couple... They got, it looks like, a dozen or so daggers right here. Yeah, a dozen daggers here. And more streaming in. So, go to overall, they are essentially... It's, they're essentially dominating this game. They're, this is their game to lose. They've got... And they have no problems. They've, they're getting rid of Steel Blue's commander. They're getting rid of a lot of Steel Blue's expansions. Stiblu's only real presence in the map outside of the main base has just been heavily threatened. It's basically, it's dead. It hasn't been killed yet, but it is dead. Stiblu, however, to their credit, is rebuilding and setting up defenses and trying to do what they can to get back in the game. But unless they get a really amazing dagger flank, and even possibly then, I, that ain't happening. Like, it's just a matter, it's just, if they got good positioning, but Steel Blue is point moving everything. If they were line moving, at least they have a chance. I know I harp on this all the time, but it's just, daggers close, daggers have a line splash. So if they're close together, they end up getting all hit at once. As we see right there, like, Gota's not really losing any daggers. That was the same number of daggers on both sides, but Gota just didn't have it. So that is it. That is that. Grand finals are going to be Randy and Gota in a rematch. So, how is that? Steel Blue, congratulations on getting third place, but... Oof, that's, that's gotta be tricky. Anyhow, we are going to be moving on after a break to the Grand Finals. Stay tuned for that, and we'll be back. And I'll have the Tournament Organizer Crow, or Psycho, or whatever they call themselves. They seem to have different names for everything. Helping me co-commentate. 
That should be fun. Anyway, stay tuned. Back in a bit. <laughs>